thanks to the magic of social media to enhance our social lives and give us a sense of community, I was reminded this week about one of the persistent ongoing conflicts in the life of the church between modernist and orthodox factions. After I posted something about how the preservation of doctrine is essential to promote and preserve the sense of community and culture in the life of the church. And someone replied to that by saying that they remember, they were there, they know what the church was like prior to the Second Vatican Council, and that they would never ever go back to that, which was kind of surprising to me because I was like, what does this have to do with what I, oh, okay, okay, let's talk about this then. And in their reply, they pinpointed a common point of contention that often gets raised in debates about modern church culture, which is that the pews used to be full and attendance used to be very high, and now they're mostly empty, which if you're a more traditionally minded person, uh, you might think, well, we have to turn back from this path that we're on because it's clearly having a deleterious effect on the life of the church and her efficacy in proclaiming the gospel to the world. But no, this person claims, don't fall for that trick. That is not the way. Sure, seminaries might have been overflowing with religious vocations and churches overflowing with attendance on every Sunday, but you'd be mistaken if you thought that that was any kind of indication of the vitality of the church in that time. He goes on to claim that most of the people in that time only came to church for compromised reasons like fear of judgment and damnation. And now that we've changed our ways and stopped using fear as a manipulative tactic to try to coerce people into coming to church, they don't come anymore. And all that remains are the few people who truly love God for the right reasons. And I've got to say, that attitude and that sentiment, if you find that persuasive, boy, I've got a huge problem with that. But before I talk about why I have a problem with that, can I just inject a little bit of skepticism into this conversation? Because I hear people say this kind of thing all the time. They say, I remember what the church was like before and it was bad. People who went to church, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't understand their faith or they came out of fear. And the emphasis was all about sin and hell. Well, let's consider this for a second because the Second Vatican Council happened between 1962 and 1965, which means to have been a very young adult at the time of the council, you would have had to have been born somewhere in the early to mid 40s, which would make you around 80 years old to have sufficient memory to know what things were like back then. Um, the people who were raising families and contributing to society and living a mature adult life there's virtually none of them left. So forgive me, but for the many people who make this claim who aren't around 80 years old, well, you were just a kid prior to the council. And do you expect us to believe that at around the age of 10, you were able to psychoanalyze all your parents and grandparents and the reasons that they went to church and come to the conclusion that they were going for all the wrong reasons? Maybe kids were a lot smarter back then, and <laughs> I suspect that they were, but... I still wouldn't trust your average 10 or even your average 20 year old to diagnose the quality of faith of the majority of Catholics today. And if you're 20 years old and you're offended by that, I'm sorry, but can we please be honest about this? There's a reason that we don't elect 20 year old bishops. It's because you don't have the formation or the life experience to compile the wisdom that is necessary to know how to govern the church and diagnose its problems. So. Forgive me for my excessive skepticism, but something tells me that these kinds of claims of personal experience of the preconciliar church have less to do with actual memories and understanding of the way things were back then, and a lot to do with talking points of people who insist that their failures in church reform are actually successes in spite of the undeniable decline of the church today. And furthermore, while we can't easily speak to people who would have been mature witnesses of the life of the church back then, we do have plenty of reading material we can turn to to give us a glimpse of the way things actually were. For example, G.K. Chesterton, who was writing at the turn of the century, in his book, The Everlasting Man, responds to the accusation that the church has hidden the face of the gentle and merciful Jesus behind rigid and inhuman dogmatism. He says that this claim is nearly the reverse of the truth in his day. The truth is that it is the image of Christ in the churches that is almost entirely mild and merciful. 
The figure in the Gospels does indeed utter in words of almost heartbreaking beauty his pity for our broken hearts, but they are far, very far from being the only sorts of words that he utters. Nevertheless, they are almost the only kind of words that the church in its popular imagery ever represents him as uttering. The popular imagery carries a great deal to excess the sentiment of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Which makes me wonder, how can Chesterton make this claim when he's writing in 1925 and win the kind of ascent of his Catholic readers in that time if all the horror stories we've heard about this fire and brimstone church from supposedly eyewitnesses of the Preconciliar Church are actually true? By his account, it sounds a lot like the church of today, which overemphasizes the mild and merciful Jesus. So already I find this claim lacking in credibility, but let's say for the sake of argument that it's true anyways. Let's say that the reason people, so many people came back then was because the majority of them came with suspicious motivations. And now that we've made changes, they don't come anymore. And for the people who remain, who were part of that preconciliar church, in their estimation, uh, this represents an improved church to the one that they remember in their adolescence. In other words, they're saying that people should only come to church if they have the exactly correct and pure reasons, which just so happen to be the same reasons that they come to church. They're saying that if people come to church with different challenges and afflictions from their own, they'd rather they not come at all, and that the fact that they don't come anymore means that the church is better off for it. Which all I can say to is, wow, how incredibly uninclusive and elitist can you possibly get? Like, I don't want to be sitting next to someone who's only there because they're afraid of going to hell. If someone is afraid of going to hell, I hope that they do come to church and that they can find some consolation and grace needed to extinguish that fear. Jesus came like a physician to heal the sick and to call sinners. And sinners will always come seeking the mercy of God with compromised motives. And as he gives them that mercy and grace, they will be transformed by that, that experience. Sometimes quickly and immediately, sometimes gradually and slowly as he untangles the knots of their lives. But the point is, they should come while they are still a mess. They don't need to be perfect in order to come. And if they're not perfect, they're going to have, again, compromised motives for coming. But at least in 1950 or 1925, when Chesterton was writing, they did come in huge numbers. And now they don't come because they don't feel welcome or included. And no wonder. But notice another thread within that sentiment and another reason why I think people don't feel comfortable or welcome at church today. It's a desire to have a church that is just so, like Goldilocks trying out different beds until she finds the one that suits her preferences just right. It's like saying, I don't want people coming to church with different needs and motivations from the ones that I have. I want people there who come for the same pure motivations that I have. In other words, I only want people there who meet with my preference and who are frankly just like me. And this temptation and desire to create a church that satisfies personal preference is pervasive in so many other aspects of church culture today. It can easily become, I only want to be around people who like the same kind of church music that I like. And I only want to be around the kinds of people who have my same appreciation for felt banners littered throughout the sanctuary. I want a liturgy that is more like the Ed Sullivan shows that I watched as a kid, rather than those scary sounding Latin incantations and angry sermons I had to sit through. But here's the thing, you can never build shared culture and community around personal preferences because personal preferences are individualistic by nature. And there's nothing wrong with having personal preferences. There are dimensions of life that are reserved just for that. But it does become a problem when you try to impose your individualistic personal preferences on everyone else. Just in practical measures, this is obviously true. My wife and I were shopping recently and they were playing loud top 40 music all over the place. And it was a really eclectic mix. It was stuff from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And at this one moment, they were playing this really absurd song. I think it was something like, Everybody dance now. When I remarked to my wife, what do you think the likelihood is that there is a majority of the ratio of people listening to this who actually like this song? Because if you actually surveyed everybody that was there, it would probably be like 2% of the people actually think, yeah, this is, this is a good song, which is why you can't impose 
pop music on people in a communal atmosphere because pop music is designed to appeal to personal individual preferences. We all have our personal preferences and the likelihood of choosing a personal preference that suits everybody's desires is not only unlikely, it's actually impossible. But when I say stuff like this, people often respond by saying, well, you would just do the same thing. You have a preference for traditional church music, and it's no different if you try to impose that on everyone else. Like, yeah, Gregorian chant and polyphony, that's just my personal preference. Like when I get into my car to go for a drive somewhere, I, I turn the radio dial to the Gregorian chant station. Chant and polyphony aren't anyone's personal preference unless they're some sort of eccentric choir master. I don't think that the Latin rite of the church should promote and prefer Latin and Gregorian chant uh, because they're just my favorite. <laughs> it's because they aren't anyone's personal preference. It, it's, it escapes all the pitfalls of trying to impose individualism on community. What could be more appropriate for a communal context than something that is liberated from the limitations of individualism? Personal preference doesn't belong in worship because the sacred is about encountering God who is wholly other from you and I and who intends to change us into something that we currently are not. But if you insist on arranging the sacred according to your personal preferences, you will be far less likely to become something that you are currently not, which you might want to rethink. Because Jesus came to save you from yourself, not to congratulate you for what you currently are. Jesus came to change us, and the thing that isn't going to change us is immersing ourselves in our personal preferences. God said, you can reserve the majority of your life in your week for arranging things just so, just the way you like it. But on Sundays, can you sacrifice your wants and desires long enough to be transformed by an experience in an environment that isn't of your own making? If we refuse to do that, if we insist on shaping the sacred dimensions of life according to our personal preferences, then we'll only ever be worshiping ourselves. It will become a cult of self-idolatry, and it's no wonder why so few people want to participate in that on Sundays, because parishes are dominated by this mentality. Maybe going back to 1950 isn't the answer to today's problems, but just because they did something in 1950 doesn't mean that it's antithetical to true progress or reform in the church. They had strengths that we clearly lack, and it is in those measures that we should draw inspiration from them and be willing to correct all of these experiments that we've undertaken that have gone clearly badly wrong. Hey, thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you are able to support the work I'm doing, there are a couple of ways you can do that, by donating through my website or by joining my online community, The Reinforcements. Both can be done by visiting brianholdsworth.ca, the .ca because that's how we internet in Canada. Members will have the opportunity to personally interact with myself and other community members, and certain levels will receive a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. Members also get free access to Christ-Centered Capital, which offers ethical investing tips that are in accord with Catholic beliefs. Even if you aren't able to support my work, consider checking both of them out at glorianshine.com and christcenteredcapital.com. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.